Hello, and welcome back to U.S. History with Mr. Snyder. Today we're finishing up this section with talking about organized labor, as in unions and such. Dur during this new era of industrialism, some workers needed protection. Your learning targets for today are we're going to assess the problems that workers faced in the late 1800s. We're going to compare the goals and strategies, and we're going to talk about some different labor organizations. And then lastly, we're going to analyze the causes and effects of different strikes for, to be uh, pr uh, exact, not strike like a bowling strike, strike like a worker's strike, obviously, but you probably already knew that. I'll just get started. The hard working conditions going on during this time um, they don't have protections like workers do today. They have low wages. There's no minimum wage, so they're working for cents per day. They're working long hours, 12-hour days. They get six days a week. They don't even get Saturday off. And they Factory treat, managers they, would they treat often these people this way because they are mostly immigrants. Money. Number one, they really don't know any better. And number two, if they are fired, profits, or if they complain, then there tragedies. is always another worker to take their the place Triangle because there's a large labor supply. A they work in, in what we call sweatshop conditions. Sweatshops were a sweatshop they the have sometimes low, in Asia today where... Long. Uh, children work in it, but it's just dark, and dirty. dangerous, hot, they dirty, young women small, and children smelly goods quickly uh, and factories, cheaply. places to work, and they don't care about the workers as long as the product People gets made. Who had recently arrived These dangerous conditions consist of badly ventilated factories. They're poorly lit. They're overheated. There's lots of accidents, and let's say I get my hand chopped off. Well, they're going to fire me because I can't do my job, and they're not going to provide me with workers' compensation or anything like that. So, basically, if you were injured, you were out of luck. Children work during this time. These low wages means everyone in the family needs to work. Kids as young as six, seven, and eight years old are working. Accidents happen to kids, too. A lot of them... A lot of the children were made to fix the machines because of their tiny hands. They could reach in, and sometimes appendages would get chopped off. It's just what happened. Women's labor, most of them worked in factories, but a lot of them were relegated to just typical traditional feminine jobs like laundresses, uh, typists, and telegraph operators. You know, the people plugging in the things and making sure they get to the... Uh, the message gets where it needs to go. Some people in these larger areas lived in what are called company towns. And these company towns are basically you live where you work. You're provided a house close to the mine, let's say. And the town is owned by the company. And stores and goods sell items on credit with high interest. So you're always in debt to the company. It's kind of a sharecropping method, but industrial-like. So you're always in debt to the company, and those are some of the hard working conditions that people had to go through. This is the time when this movement across Europe starts to spread, and some of it comes over here, and it's called socialism. Socialism is when the government or the public controls the, pri uh, the property and people's income. And the goal is to make everyone equal, equal. Wealth should be distributed equally to everyone, and society or the government should be the one to do it. The idea of socialism in, is adopted from communism, uh, from Frederick Engels and Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto. This denounces capitalism, and if you remember from section one, capitalism is the um, private control of property and income. So me and you, we control our own wages and businesses. Socialism is when the government does it. Most Americans oppose this idea of socialism, but labor activists borrow ideas from it for their reforms, and labor unions start to form. Some of them use this idea and they use something called collective bargaining. 
and it's negotiating as a group. If I go to my boss and ask for a raise, they're going to laugh at me. But if 3,000 people go to the boss and ask for a raise, they're going to take you a little bit more seriously. And if they don't give us the raise, a strike is a form of collective bargaining. And that's when workers do not work until their demands are met. This can be a local strike, it can be a statewide strike, a regional union strike, or it could be a national strike, which has happened before. Two labor unions that form are the Knights of Labor and the American Federation of Labor. Terence Powderly um, forms the Knights of Labor. They grow to 700,000 strong nationwide, and they are using their power for social gains for its skilled and unskilled workers. And the American Federation of Labor is a little more selective. This is begun by Samuel Gompers. And they focus on skilled workers only, but they are also focused on issues at work, like wages, hours, and working conditions. They're not so much uh, concerned with the social gains like the Knights of Labor were. Here are the major strikes you'll need to know, uh, all in one nice little graph. So I'll, if you want to pause this and copy this down before I go into each one specifically, the railroad strikes of 1877, the Haymarket Square strike, the Homestead strike, and the Pullman strike. The Haymarket Square strike is where people are striking, but then people in the crowd, the, these radicalists and anarchists, decide to join in on the fun, and they actually kill some police and strikers. And this is what ends the Knights of Labor Union because of the, these radical socialist idea and these anarchists that think that there should be no government at all. And employers, unfortunately, start to tie the idea of unions with violence. <coughs> in 1892, there is a specific homestead strike where a man by the name of Frick brings in the police force called the Pinkertons to break up the strike. And people get violent at that point. Police are fighting with these workers to get them to go back to work. An anarchist at that point tries to assassinate Frick, who is the owner of the company. And this, the main effect of the Homestead strike, is that it turns public opinion against unions. And then there is the Pullman strike, which I talked about the Pullman sleeper cars. This, this is a company that creates uh, train cars. Eugene V. Debs, who is going to be a political figure for the next uh, few decades, he's the leader at this time of the American Rail Workers Union, and he calls for a nationwide strike in response to this specific Pullman company decreasing wages for its workers. So 300,000 railroad the railroad workers across the country walk off the job. President Grover Cleveland takes action because he says that this is preventing commerce from happening, and if it's interstate commerce, the government can intercede, so he sends in federal troops to break up the strike. And this effect is that employers begin to use the court system to end strikes, saying that these people are violating the Sherman Antitrust Act because they are operating in restraint of free trade. And that's all you need to know for this section. It's a brief overview of the uh, strikes and organized labor introduction to the United States system. And I will see you in class tomorrow. We'll discuss it some more. Have a great night. Bye-bye.